Good morning. It's Tuesday, June 23rd, 2015. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 187, or some kind of shenanigans like that. That's got to be close enough. It's Tuesday. I don't care. It's the start of the week. That's all that matters. And we have a, well, start of this show's week, isn't it? We have a lot of news to get into today. Some very fascinating stories, some that have been sort of waiting to get paid off until today. So we're going to cover those. So why don't we jump right into it with our Mumble Room. Time appropriate greetings, El Mumble Room. Time appropriate. Hey, boy. Hey guys, I don't know quite what that was. I like it sounded like there's two of you in there today. <laughs> you guys, I said do your stretches before we start. Now come on. We have some we have some stories to discuss. Let's warm up though with some payoffs from the core infrastructure project. You might remember this. We did discuss it on this show. We did discuss it on TechSnap. It was uh, sort of a result of really Open SSL and and the uh, some of the NTP network protocol issues, all these issues that first came up uh, earlier in I guess it was last year. Jeez. And uh, then the Linux Foundation got together with industry and created a fund to help invest in some of these core infrastructure projects that we all rely on. And so we have new projects that are getting money from the Linux Foundation's initiative. Reproducible Builds is a project that uh, distributions like Fedora or Debian or really any distribution that releases uh, compiled binaries wants to be sure that uh, those those builds can be reproduced by anyone and be bit by bit identical to the binary packages from any given source to enable that, you know, independently verify that the binary matches the source code from where it came from, that it hasn't been tampered with. So that's one of the projects. The fuzzing project, this is a fuzzing software testing technique and a powerful mechanism to identify security problems in software or computer systems. And then also the false, false positive free testing. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, one of the co-founders of Trust and Soft, a company that uses the uh, pharmacy platform, you ready for that one, to detect software flaws, will receive a grant to build an open source TIS interpreter, including all extensions necessary to support false positive free operation on open SSL. Does anybody know in the mumble room exactly what that means on that one? No. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll run that one past Alan in TechSnap this week and see if he can tell me what the heck it means. Uh, what, it, what it means, though, is more banging on OpenSSL, which is obviously very good. In fact, uh, these last two both, uh, also the TIS interpreter, uh, are all mean banging on SSL, which is good because OpenSSL is obviously fundamental for online commerce. And uh, as we saw with uh, Heartbleed, when something goes wrong there, it's a massive, massive freaking issue. These are not exactly where I expected the Linux Foundation to uh, spend its core infrastructure money, but I suppose they probably know well. Um, it's interesting. I was, I guess I was hoping to see the funds go towards things that have a bigger impact today, that are maybe in wider production, that say, oh, I don't know if we're identified as having a massive flaw would once again have another huge blow to open source's credibility. That's kind of where I was hoping to see the money go. And I guess some of this stuff's going to help us accomplish those goals. It's big picture stuff, I guess. And if you have limited funds, you have to got to spend somewhere. It's probably best to spend on big picture stuff. I just worry that maybe it's going to be minimal impact. And Mumble Room, any thoughts before we move on? Well, I am happy to see that they are spending money on open SSL. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's not, and of course they're spending money on open SSL directly, but, uh, and things attached around it too are obviously very good. And uh, we all need it. We all need better security because uh, a new article in The Intercept says that uh, the GCHQ and NSA have been targeting popular antivirus companies to try to find backdoors or reverse engineer how they work so that way they can compromise people's computers, either without detection or to use the software itself to compromise the computers. Uh, so according to a top-secret GCHQ warrant renewal request written in 2008 and published today by The Intercept, the British spy agency viewed the Kaspersky software as an obstruction to hijacking to its hacking operations and needed to reverse engineer it to find ways to neutralize the problem. Doing so required a warrant. Now, they have this warrant, the request of warrant provided under the Section 5 of the UK's 1994 Intelligence Services Act must be renewed by the government minister every six months. The document published today is a renewal request for a warrant valid from July 7, 2008 until July 7, 2009. The request seeks authorization for the GCHQ activities and involves modifying commercially available software to enable interception, decryption, and other related tasks or reverse engineering the software. So essentially, they're getting the blessing from the uh, legal departments to go after Kaspersky software and reverse engineer it. Like the GCHQ, the NSA studied Kaspersky Lab software for weaknesses. In 2008, the NSA research team discovered that Kaspersky software was transmitting sensitive user information back to the company's servers. 
Interesting. That could be easily intercepted and employed to track users according to the draft of a top secret report. The information embedded was the, in the user agent strings included headers of the hypertext transfer protocol or HTTP requests. Such headers are typically sent at the beginning of web requests to identify the type of software and computer running the request. And there's an, an example of the user agent. Well, in Kaspersky's wisdom, Kaspersky, according to the NSA report, uh, re NSA researchers found that strings could be used to uniquely identify the computer's dev devices belonging to Kaspersky customers. They determined that Kaspersky user agent strings contained encoded versions of the Kaspersky serial numbers and part of the user agent string can be used to each identify each machine uniquely. They also noted that the user agent strings may contain information about services um, uh, contracted for an organization. Such, as data, such data could be used to passively track computers to determine if a target running Kaspersky software has, potentially, has been become s potentially susceptible to particular types of attack without even having to risk detection, because they could just monitor them from afar. Another way they found out what Kaspersky was vulnerable to was by monitoring emails of antivirus companies. The NSA appears to be monitoring these emails exchanges called camera, it's called Project uh, Camera Data, I think is what it is, uh, Camber Data, C-A-M-B-E-R-D-A-D-A. What they're doing is they're showing the content of malwares that would, like, so say one, uh, here's an example of like a company, uh, a Montreal-based company that was a consulting company uh, and a web hosting company. And they got some malware on their system, so they sent a copy of the malware via email to Kaspersky Labs. So the NSA picks that up, and now they know they have a certain window of time for new malware that Kaspersky Labs has just become aware of that they haven't prepared any of their clients for. And so then they would jump on that. Uh, now they say they only got about 10 new potentially malicious files per day from this particular method of uh, capture. Uh, the, the Camera Bada project, whatever you want to call it, uh, also lists 23 additional AV companies from all over the world with the head headline, more targets, with an exclamation mark on the slide. Those companies include Checkpoint Software, a pioneer, uh, which is uh, the bank that I used to work for. All of their uh, endpoint production and protection, I mean, was done with uh, Checkpoint. Uh, they're out of, based out of Israel, which is interesting since they're a big ally of the U.S., if you look at the slide, there's actually a couple of companies missing from the slide. Now, I look on this slide, I see Checkpoint, uh, I see Avast, ESET, Nod32, which is ESET, uh, I see Bitdefender, I see F-Secure, I see Dr. Webb, I see E. Aladdin, but I don't see McAfee, I don't see Semantic, and I don't see Sophos, which is a British company, which I thought was kind or of interesting. Or Malwarebytes. Yeah, I don't see that either. So these to be these the ones that say they were specifically targeting companies outside the U.S. It appears probably because they have I, other ways to work with the other companies inside the U.S. I also, I also feel like they are targeting um, companies that businesses would use because I also recognize Checkpoint from yes certain another company that I'm not going to know the yeah. name of. Usually, when you're in a certain category of business, Checkpoint comes up because it's sort of like once you're in this category of business, you buy into this category of firewall. You almost just buy based on brand. I mean, that's I worked for a bank, and you know, if you at the time, if you if the uh, FDIC walked in there and you had, you and you had some custom built firewall, <laughs> you'd they'd fire your ass and shut your bank down until you put some checkpoints in there or something else, Cisco's or something. So yeah, businesses use that stuff a lot. <clears throat> Speaking of things that businesses use, Windows freaking XP. Uh, at least that's the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy relies on a number of legacy applications and programs that are reliant on legacy Windows products. This is according to Stephen Davis, a spokesman for the Space and Naval Warfare Systems and Command in San Diego. That reliance on this technology is costing taxpayers quite a bit of money in this case. Well, it depends. Of course, it costs quite a bit of money to replace it, too. The Space and Naval War Warfare Systems Command, which runs the Navy's communications and information networks, just signed, ready for this? a $9.1 million contract earlier this month to get continued security patches for Windows XP, Office 2003, Exchange 2003, and Server 2003 from Microsoft. The U.S. Navy is going to continue to use Windows XP. Here's my question, you guys. Now, I've only been using computers my entire life. So I might misunderstand how this works. But if I write a security patch for the Internet Explorer on this computer, couldn't, isn't there a pretty high likelihood that that security patch would also work for somebody else's Internet Explorer who didn't pay $9 million? So isn't what Microsoft is actually admitting to is they're continuing to develop security patches and they're continuing to write code for Windows XP. They're just not giving it out to the public. 
which you could argue is like seriously damaging to the public good. I mean, hello, look at the look at the Target breach, look at the Home Depot breach, look at look at all of these recent software breaches that have taken place because these point of sales machines are running Windows XP and this malware is just reading their RAM. Literally now millions and millions and millions and millions of consumer records have been stolen because of Windows XP computers that do not have the up-to-date patches. And so now you're telling me that the company sitting in Redmond in the United States of America is writing software for the United States of America government that fixes these problems, paid for with tax dollars, but they just sit on the fixes? What the hell kind of sense does that make? What am I not understanding here? Most of the Navy systems don't ever actually touch an outer internet. But if they write a patch, why can't Microsoft... I mean, if it's a patch for Internet Explorer, if it's a patch for a memory problem, if it's a patch for a security thing, they can, they have many times posted hot fixes with big disclaimers that say, this is not supported. And many times they've posted fixes that say, you need to edit the registry. Don't ever edit the registry, but you have to edit the registry. Like, this is not a foreign concept for Microsoft to say, here's a thing you can do, but you shouldn't do it. Like, they do it all the time. So why could they say, hey, we wrote this patch, and it fixes this problem, but we haven't really tested it very much, so you probably shouldn't use it. I just don't understand how it's even... Why were you, like because money? It almost seems like it should be illegal. There's literally public infrastructure running on Windows XP. I, I uh, go ahead, Novu. Go ahead. You don't go ahead. You don't have to say mom. Go ahead. Okay, or not. Uh, oh, you already didn't, Benny. Oh, that's why. <laughs> I don't know. I guess it just to me it seems shocking. I don't. And I, and and this is another reason why open source. Uh, I think is better for this kind of infrastructure stuff. Uh, yeah, exactly, Sean. Exactly. You think they should switch over to Linux, Sean? Absolutely. I mean, if you take and you do that and you throw all that money into open source instead, then you get all that development in open source, helps everybody else out, and, of course, doesn't cost them near as much. Yeah. Uh, now, also, kind of uh, as... Per usual now, Microsoft is backing away from another sort of, well, here's a way, you can get Windows 10 for free. So first they, they said, uh, anybody's going to get Windows 10, non-genuine or not, we're going to let everybody get up to Windows 10. And then they walked that back the two days later. Well, now they've been saying, if you've been installing the pre-release and you're part of a, this Microsoft program, installing these pre-releases, doing all the updates, you're going to be able to update right to the final version. That's, that's going to be a legitimate way to end up with a, with a genuine 10 copy of Windows, a Windows 10 copy, whatever. Now, uh, it turns out Microsoft's actually pulled that back, too. Now, they haven't necessarily said that won't be possible, but they've walked it all back. Uh, the position has changed. On Friday, this method of getting Windows 10 uh, has veered from officialness to not so official. Uh, it went from explicitly documented to not even being on the site anymore. Doesn't mean it won't work, but it's no longer completely above board and it's probably no longer considered officially authorized. Uh, which is just... Um, there is, uh, there is such a weird, Microsoft has been so weird about how it continues to message its licensing. Microsoft has never been very clear about this. They still manage to get all these SKUs wrong. And this is so weird the way they keep doing this. You're going to get Windows for free. You get Windows and you get Windows. Oh, um, uh, by, by get Windows for free, we mean it's going to work for 90 days before you put in a key. And then it's going to stop working. Yeah, that's what we meant. I just, it's so weird. They're, they're, as much as they change, some of these strange esoteric things about how they communicate have continued to, to not get better. Like, there are some companies that can communicate with a singular message and a singular voice, and it's very clear, and it's very obvious, and they don't have to have 15 SKUs for their operating system. Um, look at Red Hat. Look at Apple. These are two great examples of companies that have very successful operating systems that still manage to pull this off very clearly. Not Microsoft. Whatever. Speaking of uh, criticized, Google got criticized for downloading a binary blob that enables the built-in uh, listening for OK, Google. Oh, shoot. And uh, it's fallen to criticism. At first, it came up uh, by the Debian project, a Debian bug report on Tuesday noting the presence of a non-audible uh, hot word module in Chromium 43. The module facilitates Google's OK Google functionality, with, which listens for the phrase via v Google's Chrome and the user's microphone, and then it attempts to you know interpret what you said and do a search query or whatever. 
Uh, the Chromium development team responded after the uh, developer uh, made the post, saying that Google, for many, uh, um, has uh, Google has made a Google has made it easier in Chromium 45 to turn it off. Now here's kind of where it gets a little trickier. Privacy online news is where you can find this. Uh, privacy on uh, privacyinternetaccess.com. I have a link in the show notes. Wrote up a post that sort of breaks it out more uh, more clearly. He says, "Yesterday news broke that Google has been stealthy downloading audio listeners onto every computer that runs Chrome." Now, this is actually kind of a misnomer. It comes already pre-bundled in Chrome. It's Chromium that it's downloading this binary in the background and then transmits audio back to Google. Effectively, this means that Google has taken itself it's taken itself the right to listen to every conversation in every room that runs Chrome somewhere without any kind of consent from the people eavesdropped on. In official statements, Google shrugged off the practice, which amounts to, "We can do that." Well. That's sort of his interpretation of it. Uh, I found this, though, to be a bit concerning. It is, in fact, downloading a binary in the background to enable microphone listening. And now it is an opt-out setting. Mm, I'm on the fence on this. I mean, I think everybody knows this is something Google does. I think if you follow the news closely, you kind of knew this was there. Um, Mumble Room, I want to turn it over to you because I know you guys have been following this story. What are your thoughts? Is Google crossing a line here or are people overreacting? I think they're crossing a line. Expand on that. What do you think? Well, I, I just don't like it. I mean, to, to listen in on people's conversations without them knowing about it, I think it should be something you would opt in, not something you opt out of. Yeah, yeah, it should be like when you I, uh, when you when Chrome starts up now, it asks you to sign in, and at the same time, it should it should say, "Would you like to turn this on or off?" Right? Exactly, exactly, and it's a, a real pain because. Chrome is like the only modern browser that works well on modern hardware, at least for me. And so to have it not be good, it just I just don't like it. Anybody else? Yeah, for me, you see, downloading Chromium, I did uh, the choice not to use the Google services stuff they put in Google Chrome. Now they're doing it via backdoor, and that's not good. Ah, uh. Ah, so you, this bugs you. This bugs you in particular because this is one of the reasons you use Chromium to begin to begin with. Ah, ah. Exactly. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out where I. So, um, like, all our phones are doing this now too, right? Oh, most of us. Anybody that has Lollipop or a Moto X or whatever. Um, Phone isn't a desktop though. But is that not? What's the? Di- I mean, like the phone's with you all the time. Yeah, That's true. But you either have your phone on your desk or in your pocket. Yeah, but a phone is made more for voice search than a desktop is. I'd rather not rely on asking my actual desktop to look for something when I want to type. Is it about porn? Is it because people watch look at porn on their computers? No, no, no. It's it's ease of use. You having a voice activation on a phone is a hell of a lot easier than trying to type with the stupid on-screen keyboard. Well, and I think about this from a business standpoint, it really bothers. Like I could see, like if I worked in a really, you know, I mean, this could be one of those things where I could this could screw a contract up, even kind of a thing. Um, yeah, especially like if I was like, all right, well, we're going to deploy Chromium because we, uh, you know, we have real privacy concerns on so sort of a. Well, anyways, uh, I, I here's where I here's where I'm here's what I'm butting up against. And I and I'm just putting it out there as devil's advocate because I think at a core level this does bother me too. And and this is this is where I keep getting with Google is I keep getting creeped out about once a week at this point. And and then what I do is I swallow it and I move forward and then I get creeped out again and I swallow it and then every now and then it's something smacks me in the face and I go, Wow, look at all that stuff I've swallowed. I take a big dump. I, pick, I take a big Google dump and I, and I pick through it and I look at all the stuff I've swallowed and I regret it. And I think I have, I've swallowed too much stuff. And this is one more thing now I have to consider swallowing. And it bothers me, even if it's not intentionally meant to be bad. It does bother me. The same time, I want a Jarvis. I want to live on the bridge of the enterprise. I kind of want an Amazon Echo. If I, had a, if I had crazy funds, I'd buy an Amazon Echo just so that way I could say, Alexia, Listen to the Linux Action Show. I want those. Th- I want to live in a world where I can say, "Okay, Google, set an alarm for 7:30 a.m." and then not have to worry about it. The thing is, is what I really, really want is something that runs on my own computer, that is a, something that I administer, where maybe I could have 
different functionality plugins for it and different components that can talk to it that uses some sort of open source back end or, or something like that, or, or something that's like Yahtzee Search that is distributed, something like that would be really amazing. Um, but every time I have to, I just don't... So it's interesting, and here's how I know it's they've cr they started crossing creepy lines, is uh, the Samsung S4s started getting some lollipop updates. I don't know if you guys that have S4s have noticed this, um, but the S4 started getting lollipop. And when you go to lollipop, you get all the new things. You get all the new stuff, including the, the sales pitch to upgrade to the new Google Photos. And the Google Photos program includes free, unlimited backup. And at first pass... There's two there, but these there's a couple. They both have an S4. First pass, they're like, "Wow, that's a great idea." And they're like, "Well, does that mean that?" So how does that? And they start asking questions. They're like, "So does that mean that Google knows like everybody I take pictures with?" And and I started and I started I showed showed them how it worked on my S6. I'm like, "Yeah, see here's categorizes like all the things like these are pictures of food, these are pictures of flowers, these are pictures of dogs, these are pictures of kids. Like it categorizes all of those. These are and then it categorizes everybody by face and by location. And then you can go in there and do combinations. I can say, show me all the pictures of Dylan at Christmas. Now I've never tagged any of these things, right? But in Google Photos, the new Photos program." I just say Dylan Christmas, and it has already analyzed all of my images and knows which ones are Christmas images and knows which ones have Dylan's face in them and automatically stitches those that request together for me and, 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 and instantaneously delivers the results. And their response wasn't, holy crap, that's cool! Their response was, how the hell did it do that? Does it look at everybody's face? They got, like, it, it wasn't, oh my god, that's amazing functionality. It was, whoa, that's creepy. So for us, we're, we are literally, I think, the boiling frogs. I think we are boiling right now. And when you take somebody from the outside and you throw them in, the, it shocks them. What do you mean? Like, so, like, all your photos are on Google right now, and so they know every location you've taken a photo, and they know everybody you've taken photos with? And, like, what about your friends that don't ever want to be on social networks? Now, doesn't Google know that you hang out with them, and hasn't they, haven't they built a social profile around those people because they've analyzed all of your photos? And it's like, yeah, that's exactly what they've done. Well, you know, this guy doesn't want to be online, and now you've just put him online by taking a picture of him and uploading to Google. Like, they, he, specifically his thing. And I was like, eh, it's true, I guess. Uh, it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird world we're slipping into. And so it, I think if you started telling people that Google Chrome was downloading a program in the background to turn on their microphone, I think that would creep some people out. When we hear about it from a technology standpoint, we're like, oh, well, they're just trying to enable a new type of search. It's not really a big deal. I don't know. What happens next when people start finding out how to access that backdoor themselves? Well, that's what I was also wondering, like, how, what does it take to change what the trigger mechanism is? Can you add things to that list? Can it be more than one thing? Could it be a hundred words that trigger the, the recording? What controls that? I understand it's not Google's Chrome, it's Chromium. I understand it, because Google's Chrome as there, already has it built in. That's why it's not happening to Google's Chrome. Chrome doesn't download in the background because it's already installed in Chrome. Chromium is downloading it separately. That's the core issue. Chromium is downloading it separately. People are using Chromium to avoid this kind of stuff. This is the core issue. We'll have, uh, we'll have uh, links in the show notes if you want to read more about it. Uh, and I do use voice search quite a bit. I find it to be, uh, I find it to be, I find it to be a pretty handy service, and I also find it to be pretty functional, especially on mobile. Uh, so, and I'm not a very good speller either. So I, I would consider using it like just to figure out how to spell things like, uh, um. How do you spell expedalicariosis monorecanosis? See what it says. How do you spell expedited oceans mother's eye can roaches? See? That's fun, you guys. That's fun. You can't have that kind of fun if you don't have the microphone on your computer turned on. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'd like to hear the community's thoughts on this, too, because I really am on the fence. I, I don't think Google has the intention of spying on us. I don't think that's what their intention is. And I don't think that matters what the intention is. I think what matters is is that this thing got downloaded and installed on people's computers. I don't think it matters the intention because they will sell that information for price to advertisers. So why is it we don't know what advertisers are doing? Well, I say I, I just I, I, I think you could make an argument that the line was crossed 
regardless of what happens with the microphone data, regardless of why they did it. I think because it happened and because people weren't properly notified and because people c couldn't opt out or in by default, because those things happened, it crosses a line. Even if it was an auto updater binary, or even if it was a GPU accelerated blah, 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 right? Or a brand new something or other. Like when you're downloading proprietary binaries in the background and installing them and activating that can activate hardware components, I feel like you're crossing a line. It doesn't matter what it does. Without user's consent, I feel like it crosses a line. If you do it at the time of installation, if you do it with user consent, if you do it with opt-in, I don't think it crosses a line. But when you do it without user consent, when you do it in the background silently without a way for them to stop it, it doesn't matter what it is, I feel like it crosses a line. The fact that it enables the microphone so that way you can say, okay, Google, that is egregious. Yeah, you know they had a conversation about this and they're saying the same thing you did, but they're like, oh, let's just not tell anybody. <laughs> Maybe. Well, you know, it works so well for our auto-update mechanism. Let's just do it for the OK Google mechanism. Maybe. Well, if you want to, <laughs> if you want to shake off the uh, Google ecosystem, shake, shake, shake it off, uh, like uh, like your girl Mariah Carey does, or whoever. <laughs> maybe I don't know. Maybe you want a Pebble Time. Pebble Times are now available to pre-order from Best Buy, starting at two hundred hundred dollars. And you can get your Pebble Time red, you can get your Pebble Time black, you can get your Pebble Time whites. And uh, of course, Pebble reviews have been going up all over up in this business, and uh, they have not actually been that good. I am. Less excited about I kickstarted oh um and mine so I got mine for a little bit cheaper than what you can pre-order now from Best Buy, um, I'm not as excited about it anymore. Not only does it have less functionality with iOS, it's basically just a remote display of notifications. You can't even you can't even limit what notifications it gets. You have to narrow it down on the phone, and and then so you can't have like all notifications go to your phone and only select go to the Pebble. It's whatever goes to the phone also goes to the watch with Pebble. There's no actions you can take under iOS with Pebble. You know, they've kept it all to the watch. I'm sure in a year or two, after Pebble's been completely squashed on iOS, they'll open some of these things up. And then, and then on Android, you get a lot more functionality. You can integrate more with Android Wear. But the, the thing has a bezel around its bezel. And I don't mean to... But that really is what it comes down to. It has a bezel around its bezel. And it is a tiny screen. And it looks like a toy... And every one I've seen has been super disappointing. Chase has one. And my initial impressions were mega disappointed. I, it just doesn't hold up to the... I just don't think it holds up to any of the thing, anything on Android Wear. And definitely doesn't hold up to the build quality of the Apple Watch. However, a couple of things have me a little excited about it. It's got that um, port that allows for expanded wristbands. That could be really cool for like um, health stuff. It's got, uh, you know, people are saying realistically four or five day battery life. Pebble advertises seven, but four or five seems to be the consistent battery life. Pfft, totally will take that. Uh, and it's got the best water resistance um, in the biz, which is nice if you want to go swimming from time to time, which I do. And uh, I, I've taken my existing Pebble swimming uh, a couple of times, and it's been nice. So it's got a few pros in the in the regard that it's the only thing right now that works between iOS and Android even if it's limited on the iOS side due to Apple's iOS constraints. Uh, it's got but it, it does do both platforms. If you're somebody that bounces around like I do, that's nice. It's got um, uh, the best battery life in the business and uh, it uh, has a pretty good strong independent ecosystem of apps and stuff and support for it. So, it's a pretty good it's pretty good watch. I think mine comes early next month. So I'll have my review when it lands, but you can pre-order yours right now for $200 from Best Buy if you want to get it from Best Buy. I don't know if the only thing going for it as there is battery life, but uh, it's also it's also like a, it's also very very thin. I think it's the thinnest of the smartwatches too, which is kind of nice. And it's the, and it also has price going for it as well. That's that is kind of a nice thing. Hey, guess what? Guess what? By popular demand. A new Jupiter Broadcasting subreddit is launched. Oh, right here, everybody. We're watching a new subreddit be born. Isn't that adorable? <laughs> oh, wait. That's not the right thing. That's not what I meant. I'll open up the airlock. That's right. And step onto the bridge of reddit.com slash r slash Jupiter Broadcasting. We now have a new general subreddit, uh, a place to discuss Jupiter Broadcasting and interact with the uh, network in general. 
and uh, for topics that maybe didn't fit in specifically with specific show subreddits. So back in the old days, we used to have a forum, and you'd have individual forums for each show, and then you'd have a general comments forum. That's kind of what this is. So reddit.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting, and uh, Crack Editor Rikai has uh, posted a first post to sort of, oh, where'd the bridge away? Hey, hold on, we're still on the bridge. Here we go. We're still on the bridge. There we go. See? Yeah. And uh, Crack Editor, hold on. <clears throat> and Crack Editor Rikai has uh, put up a first post on the subreddit over at reddit.com slash r slash Jupiter Broadcasting in response to some recent comments in the Linux Action Show subreddit. But uh, we invite everybody to go over there and make it awesome. Maybe uh, spruce it up if uh, you got something in mind and uh, join us. It, it, you, you know, we could call it the new Jupiter colony. I suppose you could. You could. And so there we go. Now I must conclude this. I'll step off the bridge, go in the airlock. Oh, I love it. God, I love having a soundboard. Yeah. If nothing else, because I always have an eagle on standby. So go check out the new Jupiter Broadcasting subreddit. Oh, refresh. Okay, I'm going to refresh. I'm refreshing. Standby. I'm refreshing. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, jeez. Thought really, Sidebite? Already? Really? <laughs> Rico! All right, cool. All right, it's good. That's good. No, that's real good. That's good. That's Hey, you know what? That's nice. That's nice. I, I, it touches my heart that uh, Sidebite gets a mention uh, in the very first uh, sub subreddit. That's, that's nice. All right, well, we'll get out of here. Uh, Patreon.com slash today if you want to support the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. We're going to be making some changes up there eventually when I get around to sort of getting all my thoughts written down. It's been taking me forever, but we want to do it right when we finally get to it. I got to update that video as well. So uh, go over there. Go to the subreddit. Join there. Also, this show has a subreddit, techtalktoday.reddit.com. Go over there and submit stories, Kickstarter projects, things that you think will make this show even better. Join me tomorrow. We'll be live at... Uh, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, jblive.tv for the video, jblive.info. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get that converted to your local time zone. All right, I will end with a... I, I love just when, when the Star Trek actors get put in really awkward commercials and then do pitches for things that are totally out of character, it warms my heart. And so uh, today we end with William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy pitching for Western Airlines. See you tomorrow, everybody. Someone just asked me why I wasn't flying the plane. <laughs> and you said, I'm not the captain. <laughs> anyway, we're on vacation. Can't they tell we're on vacation? Now, why does that look familiar? Because we've been there. Oh. I like it better here. <laughs> Frequent flyers like the future on Western Airlines. It's the only way to fly. Only. What a novel concept.